Entrevistamos Joe Salerno, diretor acadêmico do Mises Institute, que falou sobre o ressurgimento da escola austríaca, os contrapontos com o pensamento atual e sistema monetário. Acompanhe a entrevista. Professor Salerno, thank you for coming to Brazil. It's an honor to have you here. It's my pleasure, Ilio. Okay, uh, you are the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. How do you see uh, the production of, uh, of scholarly work uh, today as compared to the, the past? It's vastly superior to the time when I first started. Um, I was a graduate student uh, during the South Royalton Conference. There were very few people writing. There was uh, Israel Kirzner, Henry Hazlitt, and of course Murray Rothbard. Um, there were no applied studies, or not very many applied studies, because there weren't enough economists to, to do these things. There were treatises, there were theoretical studies. But what you're seeing today is um, a, a complete reversal of that. Now you're seeing a tremendous amount of articles on applications of uh, uh, current events. We're, we're seeing studies of, of, of the boom and bust, the housing bubble, of financial markets, and on and on. And, and much of it is finding its way now into the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics because we have many more people in academic life and that is a key thing to have. Right. Uh, what do you think is today the influence of the, the Austrian school and how does it compare uh, to the 80s or the 90s? Um, regarding the influence on the mainstream of economists and on financial journalists, we are now being noticed. Um, people like Paul Krugman, Brad DeLong, um, these leading macroeconomists now feel that they have to actually take account of the Austrian theory of the business cycle and attempt to refute it. Of course, they're doing so on the basis of very little knowledge about the Austrian school. But that, again, is something in our favor, because we know all of the Keynesian macroeconomics. They know little, very little about us, so we sound much better when we criticize them and when we give interviews and when we um, write for the various media. How, uh, what's your impression of the, the charge that some economists uh, and economic schools like the uh, Ch Chicago School, that uh, the Austrian scholars are basically just philosophers or talking about uh, politics uh, because they do not, do not like very much empirical data and statistics and regression. And All I can tell you is um, for, for people to take a look at a scholar like Murray Rothbard, who was a theoretical economist, wrote a great treatise on economics, Man, Economy, and State, but also the very next year published a book on America's Great Depression uh, in which he gave us a lot of data, in which he gave us an interpretation of an empirical, an important empirical event in the 20th century, perhaps the most important, which was the Great Depression. So Austrians today are using theory again to to apply that theory to explanations of everyday events. We're hardly just philosophers, though we make sure that we start from what we consider a true basis in deriving economic laws. Um, one uh, important and, and theme yeah. uh, that we discuss among Austrians is the question of the, uh, federal, uh, of the uh, fractional reserve uh, uh, of the banks. Uh, how do you see that discussion and what's your uh, personal view on that? I think the discussion to some extent has gotten sidetracked into a, a strictly discussion over the ethics of fractional reserve banking. Um, I see that moving away from that now uh, with um, Werther de Soto's book on uh, money and, and, and business cycles. Um, and, and I see us moving more towards a discussion on the grounds of economics, which I'm much more comfortable with. Uh, whether or not there will be fractional reserve contracts in a free market is besides the point. The point is, will fractional reserve banks be viable in a free market? And will such contracts be able to be drawn up in a way that um, respects the distinction between having property at all times at your disposal, a bailment, and loaning money? Okay? If, if you come up with contracts that allow fractional reserve banking, fine, but let us see then how the fractional reserve banks perform when they cause a credit boom and then have to suffer the consequences of a run on, on, on their um, uh, deposits. Um, what's your view on, the, uh, on the, the continental tradition of Europe uh, and the history of economic thought? Uh, it's, it was uh, almost always forgotten uh, and was recovered by Murray Rothbard and you. Uh, how do you see uh, that work now being uh, recovered? Uh, the scholastics, the Italian, the French, I want to mention that even before Murray Rothbard, there was Raymond DeRuva and Marjorie Grace Hutchinson, who also saw the importance of, of the, um, the scholastics. 
Uh, what I see is that we have given a new foundation to economics and a new foundation to the theory of subjective value. In fact, this goes back much further than Adam Smith's cost of production theory, though Smith got a little bit of the subjective value theory. And what we see now is that Europe itself was a very important um, starting point for economics. Italy, Germany, um, France, uh, J.B. Say, um, uh, an economist named uh, Her Herman uh, from, from Germany. All of these people were in the, uh, what we would call the subjective value tradition, and these are the people that the Austrian, the early Austrian economists, Karl Menger and uh, Eugen von Bambaver drew on when they, when they, when they uh, presented their, their initial works. Um, the, we're seeing today in the world uh, more and more crisis, and we are currently under one crisis, the, credit, the big credit crisis. Right. How do you see the international monetary system evolving from here? I see problems with the euro. I see that Germany is now refusing to, to or, or at least is very reluctant to bail Greece out, that Germany is, um, is insisting on sticking to the original, um, I guess, constitution of the European Monetary Union uh, and, uh, and the uh, European Central Bank. And I, I see fractures occurring. Um, these countries like Portugal, like uh, Greece and Italy, um, have been getting a free ride, in a sense, from the strong euro, which was based on the German mark to begin with. And I think that's going to come to an end, that free ride. And uh, I, I see the euro zone breaking up eventually under, under the weight of deficits and under the weight of, of national um, questions about national sovereignty. Do you think we will, in our lifetimes, uh, still see something different than uh, a fiduciary media money in the world? I think that if we have some more of a, a, a crises that, we, that have affected us in, in, in the last decade, uh, housing bubbles and so on, which I think we're destined for because they have gotten the causes wrong, I think with more of these, you're going to see people looking around for alternative monetary arrangements. That was true after the 1970s. If you recall, President Reagan impaneled a committee to study the gold standard, a return to the gold standard. Now, it was dominated by Chicago economists and eventually they recommended against the gold standard. But I think you're going to see the opportunity to re-examine the gold standard again. And by gold standard, I don't just mean gold, I also mean possibly silver or any other market commodity that is chosen by people for their, for their everyday transactions. Uh, of course, uh, if things go into the, in that direction, the governments are going to fight back. And one of the ways they are fighting back is trying to consolidate more power in, in uh, treaties, uh, like the European Union, the NAFTA, and try to centralize uh, not only monetary uh, aspects, but also fiscal aspects. How do you see that, that process going? As well? um, I see what they're, uh, uh, what they're trying to do is, is to sort of get everyone to inflate and run deficits in a coordinated way so that no one country um, suffers more in terms of depreciation of its currency than another cur uh, uh, currency. But I don't see that as working. Uh, again, you go back to what's happening with Greece in, in the European Union. Um, some countries are going to be naturally less responsible, more imprudent than other countries, and you're going to get frictions uh, uh, that, that lead to the breakup of those sorts of organizations and treaties. I'm very hopeful of that. Okay. Um, you studied uh, the Argentina uh, crisis in the past. How do you relate that to the situation that Europe is, is, is experiencing, experiencing today? Um, what happened in Argentina was that um, basically the IMF gave its seal of approval to Argentina as investments, as, as an inv a, a good place to make investments, as a safe place to make investments. So you saw a lot of, of, of capital pouring into Argentina, um, and, and, and you saw the Argentine government on the basis of that allowing an expansion of the money supply that eventually caused an inflation and caused a, a, a depreciation that led to the dissolution of the currency board. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that exact sort of scenario is going to occur in, in Europe. I, I think it's going to be a little bit different because you have other countries involved. 